Good evening, and we are back with another edition of Inside Story. I am Yinka Chambers. Good evening, and a very special welcome to my co-host. I am with Games. Inside Story is a weekly magazine program produced by the Agency for Public Information. Let's take a look at what's coming up. Homage is paid to a former Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell, and his role in the development of foreign trade and policy and bananas in this country. We look at ties between Taiwan and St. Vincent and the Grenadines by taking an in-depth look at the Raraka Bridge. On Community Beat, Vincentians living with diabetes are taught measures in dealing with the disease. And on Inside Minute, we look at past and present leaders of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Stick around. Inside Story continues after the break. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. Early reading is the key, so help them read, learn, grow. Let's show them how much fun it is to read, learn, grow. So parents, you play your part. First and foremost, reading from so young is advantageous. Link with the teachers. Working hand in hand is a must. Just 10 minutes of your child reading to you is a plus. Get fun books, make reading priority. When children read, they are able to learn. And the more they learn, the more they grow. So parents help the kids read, learn, grow. Reading is fun, kids have to know. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. So parents you play a part. This message is brought to you by the OECS USAID Early Learners Program, funded by United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to www.oecs.org slash ELP. Tourism has many benefits to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It creates growth and a boost in economic activities, infrastructure development, job creation, entrepreneurship, and is a source of foreign exchange earnings. Supermarkets and vendors, bars, restaurants, taxis, tour guides, hotels, service providers, and many more all benefit directly from income gained through the tourism industry. Taxes collected from visitors to our country help St. Vincent's economy and its growth. Tourism is everyone's business. Live it, love it, embrace it. Tourism is everyone's business. Yeah. Live it, love it, embrace it. Thanks for staying with us. The nation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is mourning the loss of one of its former Prime Minister, Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell, who passed away on Monday after a period of being ill. Sir James served as Premier of St. Vincent and the Grenadines from 1972 to 1974 and as the second Prime Minister from 1984 to 2000. A Bequin native, Sir James served as the parliamentary representative for the Northern Grenadines. He founded the New Democratic Party in 1975 and served as president until 2000. He was 90 years old. The Right Honorable Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell, former Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and founder and former leader of the New Democratic Party, died on Tuesday, November 23 at the age of 90 in Bequi. Sir James was a Privy Councillor since 1985. He was an economist, an agronomist, and a politician. He has been a dominant figure in St. Vincent and the Grenadines for almost three decades. Sir James Mitchell was born on the Grenadine island of Beckway on May 15, 1931. He was educated at the St. Vincent Grammar School. He continued his university education at the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago and at the University of British Columbia in Canada, where he earned a bachelor's degree in agriculture in 1955. Having successfully completed his studies in agronomy, Sir James Mitchell worked as a cocoa agronomist in St. Lucia in 1957. He worked as an agriculture research officer from 1958 to 1961 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. From 1962 to 1964, he lectured in science at various schools in the United Kingdom. He later became technical editor of Pest Control, a British government publication from the Department of Overseas Development, 
Sir James at the time was employed in the Ministry of Overseas Development in London as an Agricultural Research Officer for the St. Vincent government. Sir James initially entered politics in 1966 by winning a legislative seat as a candidate of the St. Vincent Labour Party. He was re-elected the following year. He was the Minister of Agriculture from 1967 to 1972. In 1972, he successfully contested in the general elections as an independent candidate, with the election ending in a 6-6 draw between the St. Vincent Labour Party and the People's Political Party. Sir James, an independent candidate, struck a deal with the PPP's leader, E.T. Joshua, and became Premier under the Alliance government. Two years later, the St. Vincent Labour Party regained power when they won 10 seats at the general elections. In December 1975, Sir James founded the New Democratic Party. He was an opposition member of parliament from 1975 until 1984 when he led his party to a 10-3 victory over the St. Vincent Labour Party. Sir James Mitchell, at the age of 53, became the second Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines from July 1984 to 2000. In 1989, Sir James's party made history when it swept all 15 parliamentary seats in the general election. One of the longest-serving Prime Ministers in Caribbean history, Sir James was also Foreign Minister from 1984 until 1992. He retired voluntarily as Prime Minister in 2000. As a regional leader who helped to form the Caribbean Agricultural Regional Development Institute, CADI, and as a professional agronomist, Sir James's interest in agriculture has extended beyond the borders of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In his opening address at the first Caribbean Agricultural Technology Conference held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2000, his message was, Agriculture must thrive, despite the challenges facing the regional sector. During his time as Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, he achieved much and is often lauded as providing economic stability and improving housing across the islands. The IMF once spoke of his economic leadership as saying, there's much to please and little to fault, a phrase which went on to become a slogan for the NDP re-election campaign. He is responsible for deepening ties with the Republic of China on Taiwan. I am pleased to record my appreciation of the mutually beneficial relations that we have had with the government and people of Taiwan. In the period that I was head of government from 1984, to 2001. Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell was dedicated to the principles of the integration process and at the 8th meeting of the Caribbean Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community in 1987, Sir James expressed the ultimate ideal when he said, as I see it, we must have one flag, one anthem and freedom of movement of people, services and capital. Sir James Mitchell is described as a true statesman and a nation builder. He was loved by Vincentians and was affectionately called Son Mitchell. Sir James found the time to write and has published articles and books on agriculture, including studies on fungicide usage and land reform, and also on the problems of Caribbean society. His autobiography, Beyond the Islands, was published by Macmillan Caribbean in 2006. Sir James Fitzalan Mitchell was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II in 1995. At the time of his death, Sir James was a member of the Interaction Council of former presidents and prime ministers. The death of Sir James Mitchell marks the end of an era, as he had been the last serving parliamentarian at the time when this country gained political independence from Britain on October 27, 1979. Don't cry for me, Argentina The truth is I never left you All through my wild days, my mad existence I kept my promise 
don't keep your distance. Sir James was a true statesman and we extend sincere condolences to his family. When we return, we hear Sir James take on St. Vincent and the Grenadines' foreign policy and the foreign trade. In this ongoing pandemic, we as a country are running the race of our lives. Do we beat COVID or does COVID beat us? And the talk of several ways of the virus to come, how do we ensure that we come out on top? That outcome will be determined by what we do. Do we take the vaccine and protect ourselves or do we gamble with the chance that COVID will not catch us? We are in the race of our lives and the goal is to win. As an athlete, I want to get to the finish line first. The question is, do we beat COVID-19 or do we allow it to beat us? St. Vincent and the Grenadines on January 1st, 2020 took up its seat as a non-permanent member on the United Nations Security Council, reaching what can be considered up to now the pinnacle of its foreign policy. But how did this small nation of 110,000 people achieve such a feat? Former Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the late Sir James Mitchell, speaks about the development of this country's foreign policy and the years of work in diplomacy that have served to place this country on the world stage. Jennifer Richardson tells us more. Group C, Latin American and Caribbean states, one seat. Number of ballot papers, 193. Number of invalid ballots, zero. Number of valid ballots, 193. Abstentions, two. Number of members present and voting, 191. Required two-third majority, 128. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 185 votes. The election of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to the UN Security Council was not accidental. It was the result of some 10 years of work in diplomacy to ensure that the desired result was achieved. In the end, this country was elected with the support of 185 member states, over 90% of the UN's membership. But how did it all begin? What is the foundation of our foreign policy and how did it develop over the years? For the purpose of this piece, we begin at 1984, when then Prime Minister Sir James Mitchell took office. What did SVG's foreign policy look like when Sir James became Prime Minister? According to Sir James, before coming to office, he knew a lot of international politics and so was aware of what was going on at the time. It is his view that the development of this country's foreign policy began with his administration and there was much work to be done. He looked back at one of the first challenges to this country's foreign policy under his leadership. That was the period when the European Union was in its infancy. And I learned a lot about the common agricultural policy, which in turn I was able to use early in formulating policy in St. Vincent. But I would like to go back before 1979, because I was involved in the movement from colonialism to statehood to independence. The very first challenge I had and this country had was when I was a member of Milton Cato's government. He went down to Guyana because he had problems with Prime, Prime Minister Burnham at the time. He wasn't president then. And uh, to settle the dispute between them, Burnham invited Milton to come to Guyana. Milton returned with a beautiful album of pictures. 
and a memorandum of understanding he had signed with Burnham that St. Vincent would not become an associated state of Britain, but of Guyana. That is the most important thing for Vincentians to know. I was a young man in the government, all of them were in the 50s and 60s, and I had already been going to Guyana. I knew about the constitution of Guyana and how it had been formed. I was sensitive to the fact that the racial divisions in Guyana is what forced Guyana into the system of proportional representation. Because if they went for our Westminster system and tried to do constituencies in the countryside, the Indians would form government. And in that process, Prime Minister Bodum wanted us, St. Vincent, to add to votes for him in Guyana. I rebelled. I got the senior people in the party to agree with me. He also reflected on his time as trade minister and the development of the banana industry. I was very much aware that the banana industry in Latin America had changed. They were exporting in boxes, and we in St. Vincent were exporting the whole hand of bananas with a lot of rubbish around it. So I wrote a memo to the executive council of the day and said I would like us to think of going into boxing bananas. That was a memo I wrote as Minister of Trade and Agriculture early after I was elected in 1966 and in government in 67, we decided to do a feasibility study. And the feasibility study showed it would be profitable. Right? And we went out to tender to see who would come forward. And among the companies bidding was Geist himself, a geese company, and a Venezuelan company. And I decided no way I was going to allow geese to have a, another foot into the banana industry. Right? And I succeeded in getting that agreed with Prime Minister Compton and the price of his agreement was that it be done in, the plant be done in St. Lucia. I said, no problem, you're the producing the most bananas, it will be economically viable for it to be there. But as a result of that, our relations with Venezuela began. Eric Gary at the time supported the idea of going to Venezuela because he had his background of living in Curacao and Aruba and he was sensitive to the possibilities in Venezuela. So after we decided on Venezuela, we began to develop relations with Venezuela. When I became premier, the Venezuelan government invited me on a state visit. I'm premier, we're not independent, no foreign policy. But would you say that is where our foreign relations started? It started, started right there. I'm telling you about the force that I know, because some of it is external affairs in Guyana, but it is now going beyond the Caribbean to Venezuela. So pleased with what I have done to introduce Venezuela into the area, the Venezuelan government invited me to do a state visit. And here was I, here am I, a young, Premier in my fort, early 40s, get on a state visit with all kinds of military attention and so on. But the British told me that I should not go and I should not accept any foreign honor because the rules laid down by Queen Anne many hundred years ago said that their ministers must not wear foreign dog colors. So when I got to Venezuela, 
The foreign ministry was most upset that I was not accepting the highest honor, the order of Simon Bolivar. So I said, I know nothing about that. And then they informed me that the British have said that I am not allowed to take it. I said, I am taking it. You make the necessary arrangements. And we did it. And I got the order of Simon Bolivar in 1972. That is where our foreign relations with Venezuela took place. Sir James spoke of his interaction with British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, which paved the way for this country's improved foreign policy, where he converted the country's external relations into benefits for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He said he is delighted to see that the current government is aiming to do that. Let me come back to the Commonwealth experience. Because our spreading our wings into the Commonwealth was a top priority. Before that, we only really dealt with Canada and, uh, and England. The second conference I attended of the Commonwealth was in Vancouver. I had graduated from the University of British Columbia, so it was felt that, that I could represent the smaller islands in the Commonwealth and also that I had knew something about Vancouver. And uh, so I was one of the lead speakers, along with Kenneth Kowunda. And uh, my speech was eminently successful. At the end of it, President Kowunda said to me, because we were at the top table, he said, you come from such a small country, and how you make such a powerful speech? I said, Mr. President, when you don't have size on your side, you got to rely on quality. He said, I want you to talk in Africa. And that is where I then went to the Zambia at his party convention and spoke. And I met a range of African leaders, including Zaire Mobutu, Yasser Arafat was there, and a few who were not yet independent, like Sam Nubia of Namibia and, uh, the, and the head of the ANC from Africa at the time, because Manzello was in there. So I was able, on that occasion, to extend ourselves in, into Africa. The former prime minister said he was instrumental in developing the country's foreign policy, even though it may not seem that way now. He said he is happy with the way some things are going. I am pleased with the fact that we have become a member of the Security Council. I think it is a distinctive honor whether we can afford it and whether the Vincentian public will feel that it is worthwhile. I am in no position to answer that. But all I would say is, in general, remember with regard to foreign policy what Tip O'Neill said, the famous speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. He said, all politics is local. Never forget that. You got to bring home the bacon. So in, in terms of our foreign policy today, that's um, for you the most progressive thing that you've seen? Well, I'm glad to see that they've continued with the things that I have started. And uh, I'm concerned that they feel as though uh, some people in foreign policy think that they invented it. I was the one that developed relations with Cuba. I was the one that signed up the agreement for 300 scholarships with the Cuban for Vincentian students. I am the one that had the relations uh, with, with, with Fidel Castro and we got along, got along very well. When Fidel Castro was going to Grenada, I went down there with Keith Mitchell because there was some controversy about his going. I said, I'll be there with you when Fidel Castro comes to Grenada. And uh, we have brought in 
we have brought in various people from time to time for people to see our relations with other countries. I'm delighted that the, the president of Taiwan made a visit recently and uh, I'm always pleased when heads of governments can come and visit us. I mean, I myself was pleased, very pleased, when I did an official visit to the United Kingdom as guest of Mrs. Thatcher. And we have to keep balancing these relations all the time. The Rabaka Bridge is quite a historic feature of the communities above the river. We take a look when we return. Understanding our ocean is education for life. Encourage your students to learn about marine life, water quality, sea level rise. Let them explore sciences. Encourage them through field trips and scholarships. The more they know, the better they can protect our oceans from litter and climate change. Let them rise to the challenge. The ocean is our responsibility. Their inheritance, their future. This message brought to you by the OECS Commission with funding from the Government of Norway. Remlet, tackling ocean pollution from turf to surf. The Rabaka Bridge, officially opened in March 2007, was a historic achievement after years of challenges for both commuters and pedestrians crossing the Dry River. The bridge took a severe beating during the eruption of the Lasso Frey volcano, but still stands. It remains another indicator of the close ties between the government and peoples of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Taiwan. The Taiwanese government has once again provided much needed assistance to repair and improve the bridge. We hear more from the API's Bavin Olivier. Since its construction in 2007, thanks to a collaboration between the government of SVG and the Republic of China, Taiwan, the Rabaka Bridge has served as a crucial piece of infrastructure which connects communities north of the Dry River with the rest of the island. The bridge was however damaged by lahars or mud flows following the volcanic eruption of April 9th. As such, the people of Taiwan have once again lent a hand to assist this country. Speaking from the Rabaka Bridge on Tuesday, Minister of Transport and Works, the Honorable Montgomery Daniel, said the repair of the bridge forms part of significant rehabilitation work being done in the community. This government, having appealed to the government of Taiwan, have received a sum of around 1.7 or so million dollars US to assist in three components of the rebuilding process in this constituency. One of those components was to purchase heavy duty equipment, the bulldozers and the caterpillars and so on. That is part of the, the overall quantum of monies that we got from Taiwan. A second component of the project is where we have to rebuild this bridge and we are rebuilding that bridge at some 106,000 US dollars. That is the cost of repairing this bridge at this time. Though I have pointed out to the ambassador this morning that in the overall assessment of the repairs of the bridge, the wing walls would not have been part of the contract that would have been established. And so both the Ministry of Transport and Works on the contractor who got the contract to do this work, OECC, and I want to thank OECC very much for responding to the contract to repair this bridge. That, that area that was left out of the wing walls to the bridge that the Ministry of Transport and Works and OECC is working out the details to have that as part of the overall project so that the full completion of the works will be done. And thirdly, the third component of the project is to ensure that the other rivers north of this river, north of the Rabakajai River, is being cleaned 
and being protected in terms of having gabion baskets and stone walls and so on. The actual stones that are in the river to make that protection along the rivers. As a matter of fact, I can say to you that Braxa, in its cleanup operations, would have done tremendous work in some of the rivers in trying to stabilize this, the river banks and to offer that level of security and protection when the rivers are down again. Because as you know, a number of the inhabitants north of the river has, has, have gone back to their homes and the rivers still, they are still heavy at times and create fear as to the channeling of the water downstream. And so Braxter would have done tremendous work in ensuring that the water stays in its path to ensure safer crossing along these rivers. And I really must commend Braxter for the work it has done. So that I believe when the Ministry of Transport and Works and Braxter do have their discussions in the works to be done in these rivers, that all of that will be taken into consideration. Ambassador, I want to say to you that north of this river, there are 21 river crossings, starting at Warabishi in Orange Hill to as far as the Fancy River. So that there are some 21 river crossings that we would have to be dealing with in this regard. Here we are today, we are launching this very important project with the Taiwanese. OECCA has been the contractor that has won the bid. And for this specific project that OECC has six weeks to complete the project. I would have been speaking to the representatives of OECC this morning and they have assured me that the works will be completed within this specific time as identified within the contract. While thanking the people of Taiwan for its continued assistance, Minister Daniel said the bridge has not only ensured the safety of road users, but also helped to improve the livelihoods of communities north of the Dry River. And I can say to you, after this bridge was established in 2007, our socio-economic conditions would have improved tremendously in this part of the country. This bridge would have helped to unite all of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to the extent that on a public holiday there are thousands of vehicles crossing this bridge to be entertained by local cuisine that would be part and parcel of this constituency over the years. Our famous Madongo dumpling, our famous Farin and Dukuna are all part of our local cuisine here. And a number of vehicles on a public holiday makes, it, makes their way north of the river to partake in, in our local foods. So that the bridge has improved our livelihoods. It has had an upliftment of our own being. And I'm sure not only the people living north of the river will miss this bridge if this bridge is gone. The majority of intentions will be affected in one way or the other if we do not have a bridge here. And so I'm thankful and grateful to the government of Taiwan for responding to a call 
from the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Who, after this bridge, was tremendously damaged after the Lahars, after the eruptions in 2021. That the damage was so outstanding that it threatened the foundations of the bridge. And so... Also speaking on Tuesday was Taiwan's ambassador to SVG, His Excellency Peter Lan, who said the government of Taiwan is delighted to play a role in the development of SVG. This project we're looking at, the Rebecca Bridge, is a very uh, symbolic one in terms of it's the testament of the long-lasting friendship in between uh, St. Vincent and Grenadines and Taiwan, as uh, His Excellency uh, Minister Daniel just mentioned. This bridge, Rebecca Bridge, was built in 2007 by a Taiwanese company, OECC, uh, to not only symbolize our friendship, but to improve the livelihood of this whole community. And we are all, and again, I want to remind everybody that this year marks the 40th anniversary of the diplomatic ties between the two countries. So as soon as we heard about the eruption of the volcano, we know that we have to take concrete actions, starting with the repair of Rebecca Bridge. And of course, as uh, His Excellency Daniel just mentioned, there are three major parts in terms of the rehabilitation and the reconstruction of the aftermath of the volcano eruption. Uh, first is the purchase of the heavy equipment. Second is the Rebecca Bridge. And third is coming, which is the cleaning of the, the rivers. And the total estimated uh, um, cost will be roughly three million U.S. dollars. And uh, our government is very happy and eager to do our part of work because it, this is necessary for the livelihood of this community and this whole country, which is also very meaningful that Tomorrow marks the 42nd Independence Day of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we are happy that we can somehow contribute in this process of rehabilitation. Thank you very much. This year marks the 40th anniversary of diplomatic ties between the Republic of China, Taiwan and SVG. Reporting for the API, I am Bavin Oliver. Vincentians living with diabetes learn more about the disease as we take in the Ministry of Health's Diabetic Fair on Community Beat. The National Performing Arts Festival Committee presents the Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines National Performing Arts Festival 2021 in collaboration with the Ministry of Tourism and Culture on November 6th, 13th, 20th, 27th and 28th. An amazing virtual showcase from the best of SVG's young, emergent, and established creatives will be on stage for the world to see. An explosion of excellent performance arts presentation will be featured along with the staging of a Caribbean classic, Moon on a Rainbow Shaw, a play by Errol John, directed by Darkie Williams. November 6th to 28th, 7.30 nightly, it's the National Performing Arts Festival 2021. Revitalize, re-energize the brand. Brought to you by the Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. And we're back. World Diabetes Day is celebrated annually on November 14th. The Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment in commemoration of this day held a health fair outside the Kingston Clinic to showcase best practices in taking care of persons with diabetes along with preventative measures. We learn more in the following segment.
we have several boots on display today. Um, we have a foot care. We have where we have blood pressure and blood sugar screening. We have HbA1c testing. And uh, we also have a nutrition area where you could come to get information on diet as it relates to diabetes. What's the feedback been like so far for the morning? We actually started at 9 and persons have been coming to get um, information. We know that we're celebrating the day um, and we're trying to still fight the COVID pan pandemic. And um, we want to give some, we don't want to leave diabetes out. We know that we would have had globally a number of patients who are diabetic who would have been hospitalized with COVID. And uh, it would have caused some disruption in services as well for them, but they are able to have access to them still, even though there are some disruptions. Diabetes is one of the leading causes of death in relation to non-communicable diseases. What are the signs for early detection of diabetes? Okay, so for if you're having frequent urination, right, you notice that you're having increased thirst. You notice that you may be sweating often. These are some signs that you need to not stay home, especially if you have family members who are diabetic as well. You need to start putting measures in place so that you either reduces your chances or you try to manage the conditions. All right, so. If you have family members with diabetes, I would advise that you start having your nutritious diet, eat healthy, that you also exercise because you want to keep your weight within a normal range. The complications and the amount that you may have would be, would be lessened because we know diabetes affect the eyes, the kidneys and the heart and so forth. So if you control your blood sugar, then the chances of you getting complication and severe complication would be reduced drastically. Even though you have diabetes, you could live a normal life, but there are some points that diabetics must follow. They must eat on time. They cannot allow themselves to go hungry. They could eat six small portions in a day. Um, they must drink a lot of water and moderation is the key. Portion control is the key. Um, for example, we have a breakfast here for a diabetic. This is showing how a diabetic should eat. We have a sweet bread. This is a fiber. It helps to feel full and you lose some weight. If you look at the plate here, it will give you an example how you have to plate your breakfast. The plate, we separate it in three parts. The main part and the other part is starch and the other part is protein. Diabetics must always um, follow their meal guide so that they will lead a healthy life and keep the sugar level as normal as possible. Also, we have a lunch plate here. If you look at it, you divide also the plate in three. Half of the plate must be vegetables. That's how a diabetic is supposed to eat. And the other half, you separate it. A quarter will be protein, which is the meat, and quarter will be the starch. Diabetics will not eat rice alone. They will eat rice and peas or rice and carrots. So it will help them to control their sugar level. This area we are doing HbA1c. It's a common diabetic test. It is also referred to as A1C. It's basically the gly glycolated hemoglobin level in the blood. And it tells us how controlled the blood sugar is or was in the past three months or so. So it's a simple test. We have our machine here. Our client has just had his test. And um, this machine, it reads the measurement in percentage. And so if you would have four percent or under, that would consider as low blood sugar. Four to five percent, that's normal. Five to six percent is pre-diabetic. And six and over, we consider that as diabetic. Okay. So it's a quick procedure. We use venous blood. It, um, it takes about five minutes. And um, it's also a reliable test. Our diabetics, they are expected to have their AB1C at least twice per year. So for diabetics out there listening, you can contact your 
health district, your practitioner, your medical doctor could assist you in having the HbA1c done. For persons who are not diabetic, it can tell you if you are pre-diabetic and that too is also important information in terms of going forward. Well, our table we are doing both blood pressure checks and GMR checks, right? And these are things that people who have diabetes and high blood pressure should be doing on a daily basis to monitor their blood pressure and their journey. You know, for the blood pressure, a perfect blood pressure is 120, 80. And for the GMA testing, the 70 to 200. 70 and below, you call it hypo. That's when the person has too low sugar in their blood pressure and blood. And hyper, hypoglycemia is over 200 and more. And these are the instruments that we use, a blood pressure cuff, a stethoscope which we will use with a manual blood pressure cuff. We have the glucometer for the GMR testing along with needles and the GMR strips. It has been good, we have reached so far 31 people are coming, most of them are hypertensive and diabetic people who normally do this every day. Some in between who just see the um, event taking place and just volunteer to come. But most of them are hypertensive and diabetic. And they, you see, these shoes are not good shoes to wear. They give hammer to At the end of the cribbit, you will use like, I have some tools here. I have this. They see this is um, to the end. That's what I use in the corner of the nails because some people will take um, like a file and just use in the nail. But you see, there's your nail bed underneath it, right? And sometimes here, so they don't curve under and it just they expose like how mine is exposed. So if I want to use like something like this to say I clean in here, I'm going to damage the person's skin. So what I use, I use this first to go in and you have to be very gentle because they are diabetic and hypertensive and some of them are very tender. So you have to be, foot care is a time taking thing. Sometimes you will take half an hour on one post and you will take an hour according to the condition of the foot. So we use this and then I have this file. Well, the files are shaped to the, the feet, the toes. So anyhow you go around the angles, you have a file to take care of that problem, right? So down between here, sometimes you see persons' skin are pushing away from the toes. That's dead cell build up down inside you. So what you need to do, you need to clean out that. And then the, this here, the skin, will join itself. Moeth, we need to remember to watch our sugar intake. That's correct. On Inside Minutes, we look at leaders past and present. The hurricane season is upon us, and as we know, hurricanes can be dangerous. Listening to the hurricane warning messages and planning ahead can reduce the chances of injury or major property damage. Before a storm or hurricane hits, get to know your emergency shelters. Contact Nemo for the closest shelter to you. Have disaster supplies on hand, flashlight and extra batteries, portable battery operated radio and extra batteries, first aid kit, non-perishable canned food and water, non-electric can opener, essential medicines, 
cash and credit cards, and sturdy shoes and raincoats. Where possible, apply hurricane roof straps. Review your insurance policy and ensure you have adequate coverage. Do not take chances with your life and property. Be hurricane ready today. Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers, and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers, rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips, rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. With the passing of former Prime Minister and leader of the NDP, Sir James Mitchell, we take this opportunity to recognize our past leaders with Moet Games on Inside Minutes. Did you know that St. Vincent and the Grenadines since its independence in 1979 has only been governed by four men who served as Prime Ministers over four decades? Prior to its independence, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was governed by George Charles, leader of the 8th Army political party, from 1951 to 1957. Ebenezer Joshua then served as Chief Minister from 1961 to 1967. The Honorable Robert Milton Cato served as Chief Minister and Premier from 1967 to 1980 and then became the first Prime Minister serving from 1980 to 1984. The Honorable Sir James Mitchell was then elected and served from 1989 to 2000. Prior to this post, he served as Premier from 1972 to 1974. Sir James handed the baton of Prime Minister to the Honorable Arnim Eustace who served from 2000 to 2001. Currently, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is governed by Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, who was elected since 2001. And that's a wrap for this weekend's Inside Story. Thanks for viewing. If you know of persons who are doing positive things in your community, tell us about them at 456-1600 or send us an email at apisvg2014 at gmail.com. For more news briefings and updates, look out for Ion Government on Tuesdays and Thursdays on this station at 8 p.m. and Wednesdays and Fridays on VC3 at 8 p.m. You can also tune in to Mining Government's Business on Wednesdays on NBC Radio at 7.30 p.m. or follow the API's pages on YouTube and Facebook. Until next time, I am Worth Games. And I am Yinka Chambers. Do have a pleasant weekend. <music>